Oh, thank you. Uh, good, after good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. So I, I, I thought I would talk uh, this afternoon um, for about 15 to 20 minutes about uh, organic solar cells and photodetectors. At first sight, uh, very similar devices. Uh, there are some differences which I will point out in the beginning. And maybe the two fields can learn something from each other. Um, here, a brief introduction. I, I just said um, photodetectors or solar cells and even LEDs, they are very similar uh, devices conceptually. They have a transparent electrode and then usually the, the active layer which you want to emit or absorb light is sandwiched between a selective contact for holes and a selective contact for electrons. If you apply a voltage, current will flow and if you do this in the dark, the IV curve will look typically like this and in the forward regime when holes go in and electrons go in through the P and N contact, uh, then you're here at these voltages, uh, the electron and hole will meet in the layer you sandwich between those two contacts and light will be emitted depending a bit on what's sandwiched in between the two contacts. Um, if you now shine light on such a device, uh, the opposite will happen and current will flow out. Uh, as I was, was already said in the introduction, uh, yeah, the IV curve will, will shift down and there will be a point where the power generated uh, will be maximum. That's the maximum power point. This is where solar cells work, uh, where you try to optimize uh, VOC, short circuit current, and this point to a such and high as possible value. For photodetectors, well, it's basically the same device, but then you operate it more here in the uh, reverse bias regime or close to uh, zero volts since there the difference between dark and light is the highest or the difference between noise current and photo current is higher in this uh, quadrant. Um, so here summarize what's what's the difference between OPV and OPD so organic photovoltaics or organic photodetectors. Well for both you would like to have a high external quantum efficiency uh, for solar cells, you want broadband um, absorption, so as much light absorbed above the band gap, preferably everything, and then you will have high short circuit current. You care about fill factor, you care about open circuit voltage, because the product of all these things is, photo, is the power conversion efficiency, which you want as high as possible. For a photodetector, you don't care about power conversion efficiency. You do care about external quantum efficiency. It doesn't have to be over a broad range necessarily, depending on the application. Uh, it might also be at a certain wavelength, but uh, if you want to detect only one wavelength, but at that wavelength, then you want an, as high as possible uh, external quantum efficiency. There, instead of caring about fill factor and open circuit voltage, you care about noise current because you want an as high as possible signal to noise ratio, so low noise currents. Uh, the signal to noise ratio in photodetectors is, is quantified more or less by a parameter called specific detectivity. You can see this as some type of normalized signal to noise ratio. It's basically the ratio between the EQE, or it's proportional to the ratio between the EQE and the noise current. So this number you want very high, so you want high EQEs at the wavelength you want to detect, and low noise currents. Other important things which are of no importance in OPV are, for example, the linear dynamic range or the cutoff frequency. Those things I will not talk about uh, in this talk. So some similarities and some differences uh, also in optimization, as you can see. We are working um, here together with the chemistry group in, in Hasselt uh, on organic photodetectors and specifically on near-infrared uh, organic photodetectors. Um, I think Herwin will talk more about applications of organic photodetectors. I, I select one here. Um, which might be interesting. Uh, it's to make uh, infrared uh, imagers. Um, how this is done now, um, you need these INGAS uh, inorganic detectors, but they have to still be re read out by silicon circuitry or CMOS circuitry. Um, so you have to, and, and how this happens today is they are manually soldered onto uh, these chips. It's a time consuming process, lots of mistakes, um, and that's what makes it very expensive. If you could replace this ingas 
infrared detector or near infrared detector by an organic one, which you can just spin code or late code on top of your CMOS readout sensor, you could extend the absorption range of silicon to wavelengths beyond 900,000 nanometer. That's why we are looking for uh, materials with with uh, acid conjugated polymers with absorption and EQE spectra um, beyond the thousand nanometer. It's not so easy. Uh, this is the best we have. Uh, the, the chemistry group makes, makes these type of uh, materials. Um, and then we blend them with PCBM and then um, the best we, we, we can get, at least in the range longer than a thousand nanometer, are EQEs. Around 20% in a wavelength range, well, up to 1400, 1500 nanometer. It, it doesn't go off so steep. Um, it's not bad for a first try, but it, uh, it could be better. We could get higher EQEs, hopefully, uh, and lower dark currents. I will talk about this later. Um, so, well, to, to now further optimize these type of devices and to know, well, how far can we go? Because um, using this donor acceptor concept uh, on the backbone, you can rather easily also make absorbers which go all the way to two micron uh, or 1800 nanometer. When we try those materials, we get extremely high dark currents and basically shorts. Um, so it's interesting to figure out and, and um, use some physics. And then I also feel a bit useful to figure out how far in the infrared can we go, uh, up, to, up to which wavelengths can we still make, uh, or does it make sense to make organic near-infrared detectors? Um, um, that's a bit the questions we, we wanted to answer. To, to answer this question, first again, some basic uh, concepts. So what we want for a good photo detector is a high EQE, that's, that's maybe logical, but also a low noise current. Noise current, very roughly and in general, is proportional to the square root of the dark current. So, so photodetectors are operated here in this negative voltage regime. Uh, you have a certain dark current there. Um, if that dark current is high, the noise current will increase approximately with, this, with the square root of the uh, dark current. What we know from solar cells is that, the, that this formula here, which you can see here, uh, is valid for the open circuit voltage. Uh, at least for an ideal diode, it, it would be like this. The open circuit voltage is proportional with the, log, the, the logarithm of the ratio between the photocurrent, the short circuit current, and the ideal uh, or the diode saturation current, if you have an ideal diode. Now, all the diodes we make are often far from ideal, so the dark current we measure is usually much larger than uh, the ideal uh, diode saturation current, um, which would mean that the open circuit voltage would always be larger than this quantity here. Uh, you'll see why I write it like this in, in, in the next slide, why this is useful. This, this is a way to link your open circuit voltage to dark currents and maybe noise currents. That's where we, are, we want to go to. So on this, on this plot, we made a plot of um, the measured open circuit voltage. And what we plot here is the photo current divided by the dark current, the measured dark current. Making, if you plot this, this line here or this equation, that's the red line that's plotted here. And what the equation says and what's also then experimentally observed is that in, indeed the measured open circuit voltage is always higher than uh, this equation here, this value here. So every points are above the red line for every donor acceptor blend we make. So in the limit, if you go to very low open circuit voltages, where your dark current is not dominated by shunts or contacts anymore, but really by active layers, so by the ideal diode dark current, if you go to very low open circuit voltage, very low gaps, you see that um, the, this equation becomes an, an, not a larger than, but an equal to. So these points are coming close, close to the red line. Um, so that's why this is a useful uh, equation. And it tells you when you go to very low gaps, um, this equation becomes uh, valid. Um, in that range, then, we can uh, connect the noise current to the open circuit voltage. Why did I do all this trouble to link uh, something to open circuit voltage of 
diodes because yeah, we did a lot of work on open circuit voltage uh, of donor acceptor blends. Uh, I, we feel we know something about this. <coughs> uh, and then we can use all that knowledge to link it to uh, noise currents for infrared detectors and see how far we can push performances of infrared detectors. So that's why I switch now a bit to the open circuit voltage of such donor acceptor blends. That's then useful for solar cells. And as you will see later, useful to draw conclusions on noise currents in photodetectors. Okay, what determines the open circuit voltage in a donor acceptor blend? Well, in the donor acceptor blend, you have a blend of the two materials. Uh, the donor I indicate here in, in purple, the acceptor in red balls. Uh, the exciton goes to the interface and then you have a charge transfer state. That one makes free carriers and if the free carriers come travel around in the device at open circuit and meet each other again, they reform this type of CT state um, with a certain energy here. And if you measure the energy of the CT state plotted on this axis and you compare it to the open circuit voltage measured under solar conditions, um, you get basically a, a very good correlation. Uh, you get a straight line. These are about 100 different donor acceptor blends. They're not all fullerene based acceptors. They're not all polymers. They're also small molecule blends. So it's basically all the organics or all the donor acceptor blends we, we could find. Um, so <clears throat> to make a good solar cell, and you will see later, then also to make a good photo detector, you would like to minimize uh, these voltage losses. So you I play with HOMO and LUMO values to get the CT state energy as high as possible. And then you would preferably also like to have your VOC as close to the CT state energy as possible. Usually, and this you can basically see here, um, there's always a difference uh, between VOC and CT state energy around zero, between 0 0.5 and 0 0.7 EV. And it looks like the lower uh, the CT state energy is, the more the difference goes to the high side. And if you increase the CT state energy, the difference actually gets a bit lower. So it would be nice to understand where this difference comes from. And if we can actually do something about this, then we would have higher VOCs for the same gaps, which would increase the efficiency. Um, so now I've, here is again this energy diagram. Now I only focus on the CT state and I, I, I draw a bit again at the ground state energy, the CT state energy. I draw here the open circuit voltage. Um, you can calculate an upper limit for the open circuit voltage. That's the, the, the limit of VOC if only radiative recombination would be present. Um, this is a value which, which is about 0 0.2 EV below uh, the CT state energy or below the gap energy. Um, and then the difference between this maximum VOC you would which you can theoretically calculate. And the real VOC, uh, we call the non-radiative uh, voltage losses. That's this part. Uh, and you can prove by theory that these non-radiative voltage losses are connected to the electroluminescence quantum efficiency of the solar cell. So you can see if EQE, EL in this formula would be one, then you have LN1, which is zero, then VOC equals the radiative limit. That's why it's called the radiative limit, no non-radiative recombination. If you have extra recombination, your voltage will drop by uh, this formula. Um, so on this plot here, on the right hand side, we plot again ECT, but in this case uh, we don't plot it against VOC, but we plot it against, or we plot this value on the y-axis. This value is, is basically the length of this arrow, or it's this Part. That's why you also see EQEEL standing here. Here are the high EQEELs, here are the low EQEELs. Here are the high voltage, non-rated voltage losses, here are the low non-rated voltage losses. This is again for all the fullerene and non-fullerene based devices we can find. And you see a lot of scatter on the data, but a clear trend. You see that the lower the CT state energy, the higher the non-rated voltage losses, or the worse, uh, the more non-radiative decay, and the lower the EQEEL. Um, this indicates that uh, these large voltage losses are um, intrinsic. They are uh, maybe related to the fact that we use organic materials. Because similar um, observations have been made uh, for organic materials, um, when you plot emission energy of the excited state or emission wavelength 
or the, the energy of the triplet state on the x-axis, and you pl plot, for example, the non-radiative decay rate on the y-axis, then you can see that it's often observed that uh, the lower the emission energy, the higher the non-radiative decay rate. Um, here is the same for, for some triplet emitters. The lower the uh, emission energy, uh, the higher the non-radiative decay rate. Um, something similar if you plot electroluminescence quantum efficiencies for the best OLEDs you can find. Well, in the visible, you, you have 100% emission quantum efficiency, but when you start going to the infrared, it's very hard or if the, the emission quantum efficiency drops pretty rapidly. Uh, and I don't think anyone has ever has found uh, uh, an, an organic emitter at 900 nanometer or longer uh, with an electroluminous quantum yield uh, of unity. So this seems uh, something general for organics, and the, the reason why it is so difficult to find at, at low uh, excitation energies to find um, good or high EQEELs is because the non-radiative rate uh, increases with decreasing uh, emission energy. Um, this is the, the explanation uh, uh, given to this effect for, for it's called the, the energy gap law for, for radiationless transitions in large uh, or in molecules, in organic molecules. The reason why uh, um, a low excitation energy, as drawn here, uh, you have more non-rated recombination than when you have a high um, excitation energy is because tunneling, uh, if you see non-rated recombination as tunneling from the uh, excited state to a higher vibrational energy of the ground state, this tunneling is um, proportional to the wave function overlap, and you can see that the wave function overlap or the higher vibrational states of the ground state um, is less when this when the emission energy is higher. When the emission energy is lower, you you can easily more easily couple to or tunnel to a lower vibrational uh, energy state of the ground state. Um, if you want to know more about this, and I think this is important because these non-radiative transitions are limiting VOC, and you will see later they will are also limiting the noise current, at least for the very low gap acceptors. Uh, so we need to understand uh, these concepts better. So if you want to understand this better, it's these type of papers which uh, you should read. Okay. Having this and, and using, uh, we, we were here, uh, this graph I've shown you before and the CT state energy or the, the gap energy versus the non-radiative uh, losses. Uh, so you see they are, we haven't found anywhere they, these non-radiative losses are zero. Um, and well, you can draw some empirical lines to here and basically say, well, since we haven't found any um, uh, organics with non-radiative voltage losses being far below what's drawn here. This must mean that the maximum efficiency of organic solar cells is reduced from the radiative limit. Uh, the radiative limit or the shockley kaiser limit for solar cells, uh, for a single junction solar cell, that's this black curve. That assumes EQEEL is one. If you now assume, well, EQEEL is gonna follow uh, a relation a bit like this. Uh, we've drawn here two, two lines, a lower limit. I forgot to draw the lines here and an average limit. This would reduce uh, the maximum efficiency you can get with organics from 33 to 25. I think we would be very happy if we can get 25. Um, so, it, But that would mean that we need very high external quantum, photovoltaic external quantum efficiencies, very high fill factors of 90%. Um, then we would reach here above 20%. So it's not impossible with organics to reach efficiencies above 20%. This is what we need to do from this. And the other thing which you can learn from this, if you want to increase, uh, yeah, the, the other thing you can um, deduce from this is that the, the optimum gap for a single junction solar cell is not uh, 1.1 EV as in, as in inorganics, but it's actually uh, higher, more around 1.5, maybe even 1.6 EV to be on the safe side. So it doesn't make sense to lower the gaps even more, at least for single junction organic solar cells. Okay, that was uh, for solar cells and an, an, an efficiency limit. We can do something similar now for the photodetectors, at least the infrared photodetectors, because uh, we, we learned all this about VOC. And then previously we have said, well, in this 
where the gaps of the organics are very low, uh, the dark current is linked to the VOC via uh, formulas like this. Um, and, the dark, and the VOC is linked to the energy of the CT state as, as, long, uh, as uh, in the regime where the CT state energies are low enough. In this regime, dark currents are limited by other things, contacts, traps, pinholes in the device, uh, and so on. But once the, the, the gaps are low enough, the, the intrinsic dark currents are so high, they dominate all other um, effects. And at this point, you can link everything we know about VOC and ECT to the dark currents. So from that point on is actually for wavelengths longer than 1300 nanometer. Uh, so in this regime. Um, if we then use the same approach, well, again, this graph here is basically the same graph of you've shown before, just plotted uh, with different colors and different points. It's, it's again the ECT versus the non-radiative voltage losses, which we can link to VOC, which we can then link to dark currents, which we then can link. And that's what we did here uh, on this graph. We plot wavelength versus this specific detectivity. This specific detectivity is the signal to noise ratio, which is important for photodetectors or something proportional to signal to noise ratio, which is important for photodetectors. You want as high as possible, so low noise and high EQs. So for silicon, for example, this specific detectivity in this range, uh, this is the absorption range of silicon, it, it goes over 10 to the power 13. For the ingas detectors and germanium detectors, we're more here 10 to the power 12, but they, uh, of course, extend to wavelengths uh, around uh, 1,800 nanometers. The black curves are, are the best organics, uh, at least in the in beyond, which go beyond the 1,000 nanometer, which we have. So they are not as good as silicon. They extend the wavelength range a bit. They are in that wavelength range a bit better than ingas, but ingas goes deeper. So the question I asked in the beginning was, well, does it make sense? Can we, with organics, extend our wavelength range as much as, for example, uh, in, uh, INGAS, uh, and keep the same low dark currents and the same high detectivities. Well, if the VOC, uh, if the non-radiative losses remain like they are, like, like plotted here with the blue line, so we use the blue line, we know about VOC, we link it to the dark current, we link it to the noise current, then you would expect specific detectivities not uh, exceeding the blue curve here in this graph. Which would mean that if you want to keep the same sensitivity signal to noise ratio as INGAS with organics, we predict that you can do this, but you can do this only up to here, maybe 1300, 1400 nanometer and not further. Unless we found concepts which decrease all these non-radiative losses and this non-radiative recombination to values like the green line or the red line. The red line is from a model which assumes very low reorganization energies. Uh, then we would get specific detectivities um, like the red curve here or maximum specific detectivities like the red curve and we would be able to reach here. Even then we will not beat in this small uh, wavelength range in gas detectors. Uh, maybe that's not necessary, but it's good to know what we can and cannot do, uh, what we expect to can and cannot do with organic photodetectors. That's what I uh, want to show with this graph. So up to 1600 nanometer uh, might make sense to try, unless you can live with lower signal to noise ratios, depending on the application. Um, okay, I still have, no, I don't have any more time, I think. Or do I? Well, maybe I'll just take two minutes. I, I wanted to show you an approach uh, besides uh, to go to the, just stop me when I need to stop and I'll just continue. I wanted to show you an approach uh, which we have, which uh, which doesn't, uh, because it's not so easy to make very low gap uh, polymers and then find the right acceptor to combine with them. So the approach we are following is to try to use charge transfer absorption to increase um, in, to, no, to, to achieve infrared absorption. Here is a, a material system, PBTTT, blended with PCBM. There's a lot of interface, um, which makes that there would be a lot of interfacial absorption. But as you can see, this is on a logarithmic scale, the EQE. Here is the gap of PBTTT, here's the gap of PCBM. And then all this absorption here extends all the way to the infrared. 
uh, that's all charge transfer absorption, so absorption from the interface between the donor and the acceptor only. It's a pity, it's it's nice in the infrared, it's broad, it's just weak, it's 50 times weaker than PV triple T absorption. So we looked for concepts to increase the CT absorption. One easy, well, easy way to do this is instead of using transparent electrodes is to use partly reflecting electrodes. In that case, light goes into the device and start bouncing in between the two mirrors until it's absorbed, at least roughly. Uh, this only happens for certain resonance wavelengths, which are proportional to the thickness of what's sandwiched between the two mirrors. So if you do this for PB triple T and you replace the ITO with a with a thin layer of silver, which is partly reflecting, you, you can get these effects. And then when you tune the thickness, and this is what I'll do when I push the next slide, you can see um, we can basically increase CT absorption in a certain wavelength range. Um, and this wavelength, this, this, this wavelength, the resonance wavelength is proportional to the thickness. And we can get EQEs up to uh, 15 at uh, the simulation is, is the, is, are the top curves. This is the, the real measurement. So here we are at 1.25 EV, that's half an EV below the gap of C60 and triple T, and we still have an EQE of 10%, which is purely based on CT absorption, but then increased by this cavity uh, concept. We can also go to the second overtone, and then we get a bit sharper peaks and a bit higher EQEs. You can do this, well, the nice thing is because this the resonance wavelength only depends on the thickness of the active layer, um, you can basically very quickly make a spectrometer uh, like this, you, you print a, a layer with changing thickness and you then you have a gradient um, of in the thickness and then you, you put the electrodes on top, the, the two partly reflecting and fully reflecting electrodes and then each pixel detects another wavelength uh, and we've proved that it works by measuring the transmission of water which has a peak around a thousand nanometer. I will slowly uh, stop and skip a bit. Uh, we did the same for small molecule solar cells. Uh, we measured response times, if, if you, which can be rather fast. Uh, well, they're not uh, good enough for, for very high speed networks or something like this, but good enough for readout if you would want to put it in an imager or something. Uh, what we're further trying to do is go to further, to, to really long wavelengths. We do this then simply by, um, yeah, in, overall de increasing the HOMO or decreasing the LUMO. Here are some examples uh, which we are doing this. The success is not very high yet, not very high EQEs yet, mainly because we're using materials from OPV, the failed OPV materials, basically, the low VOC OPV materials. And we're also playing with the cavities a bit. We're here, for example, we put two cavities on top of each other, and then you have two detectors, one detector which detects one wavelength and another detector on the bottom which detects another a second wavelength. You can use this, for example, in temperature sensors or to recognize uh, certain, com certain uh, uh, species which absorb at those two wavelengths. Okay, uh, yes. In, in this full speed last part, I made it to my conclusions, with, uh, which maybe I'll just let you read because I spoke long enough. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Ip.